everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is a topic I'm I'm really excited to talk with you about because um, it's it's time to pull the curtain. It's a long time to pull the curtain back on how plastic got into everything, how oil got into everything, um, how we got here, and how we can find our way out. Um, so. Um, all right, so here's the outline. Someone once told me life is too short for outlines, so I'm just gonna go right for it. But just a little disclaimer, what are plastics? Where do they come from, right? What are they made of? And so originally, plastic just meant pliable and moldable. Um, but more recently, as things have developed, it's now considered a class of materials called polymers. What's a polymer? Polymer, poly means a lot. <laughs> um, and it means a lot of molecules linked together. So polymers are essentially really long chains of molecules with repeating units. And there's natural polymers like cellulose and silk, um, rubber, um, different resins. Um, and then there's synthetic polymers. And synthetic polymers are kind of what we know as plastic today. Um, these are made from coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, so the story of plastic is kind of the story how, how oil got into everything. Okay, so how does oil become plastic, right? Like how does it, all the clothes we wear, the containers, um, how does oil become plastic? Well, I wanna walk you through the kind of cradle to grave life cycle of how oil becomes plastic. It starts with drilling. Crude oil is extracted from the earth. And you kind of think of, people think of crude oil as this black gunky one thing, but it's actually not one thing. It is like a chemical soup of different molecules. And these molecules are hydrocarbons and they're the remains of dinosaurs and plants from hundreds of millions of years ago. And so it's kind of like a chemical soup of big and small hydrocarbon molecules all jumbled up. So the crude oil gets cleaned and then it gets sent to a refinery where they can be unjumbled into the building blocks of what becomes everything from tar and fuel and plastics and even our fertilizer, if you can believe it. And that's at a refinery. And a refinery is something that's acres and acres long and thousands and thousands and thousands of pipes. And basically through heat, you separate the different components of this chemical soup of oil um, into the separate components because the heavy things stay at the bottom like tar and kerosene and the lighter things go upward. So your ethylene molecules, which become polyethylene, which is PET. Um, methane goes to the top, believe it or not, that becomes the fertilizer for the food we eat as well as fuels. Um, and after these things are separated, they go down these really long pipes um, and they wind up in the chemical plant. And in the chemical plant, that's where these individual molecules get linked together into polymers or plastics as we know it. And depending with what kind of chemistry you hit them with, you can make them crystalline, you can make them floppy. Um, you can, they can have all these different me mechanical properties um, based on how you link them together. Now, challenge of this is that in linking them together, you introduce a lot of the things that link them in special ways are pretty toxic chemicals. They're called endocrine disruptors and they can completely disrupt your thyroid function and your immune system. And now we've got this pervasively flowing through all of our materials. But in any case, these are used to make really long chains of polymers, much longer than natural polymers like cellulose. Those polymers are all different. So ethylene becomes polyethylene, esters become polyester. Um, uh, propene molecules become polypropylene or a fleece. They get squished into these plastic pellets and then they go on to the next stage where they actually get extruded and molded into all the products we know today. And when I say all the products, I mean not only bottles and clothing and plastic bags and toothpaste containers, but it actually is in the toothpaste itself. So this is kind of really in everything. All right, so that's where we're going to start. Um, so it, plastic and essentially oil is in everything. It's in our clothes, our toothbrush, the bristles on the toothbrush, the toothpaste um, to brush out the oil um, that's kind of built into the fertilizer and the food we eat. So how did this happen? I mean, where did it all begin? 
Um, so then the next section is really like, how did oil get into everything? Um, and to do this, I kind of want to rewind back to before synthetic plastics. Um, and now like late 1800s, um, in 1869, there, well, let's back up. It was at this time, there were no, things were not made from oil. They were made from the natural world. Ivory was made from tusks. Tortoise shell combs were made from tortoise shells. Uh, resins were made from shellac from beetles. Your combs were silver. Your clothes were cotton, right? Um, and so now, interestingly, the first uh, synthetic plastic was actually a $10,000 challenge in 1869. Um, where a New York firm offered a $10,000 prize for a substitute for, of all things, billiard balls, because they were made from ivory. Um, and I think that's not unreasonable. You don't want to be slaughtering elf elephants for anything, especially not to play pool. Um, so um, a chemist named uh, John Wesley Hyatt in 1869 treated cellulose, and this was from cotton that you see at the bottom of the screen, with something called camphor. And he actually made this moldable plastic that could be shaped into different forms and natural substances to replace things like tortoise shell, horns, linen, and ivory. He called this celluloid or because um, it was a cellulose colloid. And a colloid is like a is a Greek word for glue. So now you have these moldable, gluey things. And this was the first plastic of its kind. It wasn't a fully synthetic plastic because it was based on um, partly on cellulose. Um, but like this discovery was revolutionary, right? Now we don't, we're not limited by the constraints of nature. We are always limited by the constraints of nature, but to the eyes of what's possible, we don't need to kind of have elephants for ivory. We can have the materials we wanna have um, for more abundant materials. So this was just the beginning. Let's fast forward to the late 1800s and something else was happening. Electricity was happening. Um, and scientists were tinkering around with electricity. Electricity is pretty awesome. We can all agree on that. But electricity starts a lot of fires. There's a lot of sparks flying. All the coatings and wires and plugs need to be insulated. And at that time, in the late 1800s, it was being insulated with shellac. And that shellac came from the lac beetle. Um, the lac beetle is also used as an ancient textile dye. We, at that time, we got our colors and our clothes and everything just from the natural world. Um, but there was a problem with that. Although it was insulating and although it was heat proof and it worked really well, it would take six, six months and 15,000 beetles to get one pound of shellac. So electrifying the nation, challenging with um, those beetles as much as they offer us. So many people were searching for a replacement for shellac, understandably, um, to insulate wires. And um, when one option was that there was another option out there was like, how can we make resins? And kerosene was really used for lighting. Um, there was a, a one more abundant substance that had not really been tapped and that was oil. Oil was just kind of pulled out, kerosene was pulled out of oil um, for lighting purposes. But once you finished making the kerosene, there was all this gunk left over. Um, we know that gunk is that soup of hydrocarbons that can be used to make all the things we make today, but they didn't know that then. But scientists said, there, there's something in there, it's got to be something we can do with that gunk. Um, so chemists were tinkering around how to use it and like, the beginning of most scientific investigations, it was kind of a disaster. There was fires, there was like stinky fumes, there was sticky gunk. But step by step, uh, a chemist named Leo Bakelin, who kept a meticulous diary, was really pushing on a replacement for shellac as insulation. Um, and he also had his share of fires and stinky gunk. And at some point he realized to control this process and pull out some other materials, I need a special oven. The special oven doesn't exist, so he's a scientist. He makes one. He makes an oven, this, this kind of steampunk egg that you see on the right, and he puts it, um, he makes one, he makes it in his garage, and, and uh, Leo Bakelin calls his oven the bakelizer. Um, he, it, this can give him precise control over temperature and pressure. Um, although it looks like a giant steampunk egg, it works. And in 1907, Leo takes phenol, 
which comes from tar or coal, and mixes it with formaldehyde, puts it in his bakelizer, sets the temperature and pressure after much trial and error just right, and out comes from this gunk, this like amber, shiny resin perfectly molded to the test tube. Psh, game changer, total game changer. Leo Bakeland from his bakelizer decided to call the first ever synthetic plastic Bakelite, not like he really didn't go out on a limb for naming things. Um, and this changed everything, okay? Not only was this Bakelite a good insulator, it was durable, it was heat resistant, and unlike celluloid, you could easily mass produce it. You didn't need cotton to do it. You just needed um, the residual of kerosene and formaldehyde, which was not hard to obtain. It was marketed as the material of a thousand uses. It could be shaped or molded into anything the possibilities seemed endless. This landed him on the cover of Time magazine in 1924. And this was wildly exciting to people because for the first time, human manufacturing was not constrained by the limits of nature, or so they thought. Because as we know, the limits of nature are a very real and important thing. But now humans could create new materials. So this helped not only people, but in principle, the environment, because advertisements praised these new plastics as the savior of the elephant and the tortoise. Plastics could protect the natural world from the destructive forces of human need. Quite a line to look back on, you know, 100 years later. All right. So during World War II, plastic production in the United States increased by 300%. Nylon was invented in 1935 as a synthetic silk, was used during the war for parachutes, gloves, helmet liners, plexiglass was um, treated, uh, was an alternative for air class windows. And um, at the end of the war, you know, this kind of led to this whole like culture of convenience and endless possibilities for the human enterprise. And in 1962, a video celebrating human's ingenious invention that freed it from the limits of nature was made. I have to share this because it really sets the stage um, for this perspective. Let me know. Plastics. Materials devised by the mind of man. Simple chemicals from coal, oil, cotton, water, air, reacted together, built up, atom by atom, into substances entirely new. All right. So... The plastic revolution was just getting started, but it turns out that revolution would end up in the garbage can by design. Um, so the next section is the future of plastics is in the garbage can. And that sounds like a crazy title, but that was actually a statement made by industry, the plastic industry. There were huge, people were actually, so this is now 1955, it's after the war, all these things can be made of plastic. And there was a huge campaigns to promote single use. Um, this is the cover of Time, this is an article on Time Magazine about celebrating disposable culture, throwaway living. I mean, where they're absolutely celebrating having materials made from oil and coal and finite natural resources used once and with great reckless abandon and pleasure discarded. Um, but the thing is, people were still leaving kind of a, a, a war mentality. And I mean, I don't know, as a, uh, you know, a child of immigrants myself, we certainly didn't grow up throwing things out. And the industry knew this. Um, the industry knew this. And so they actually had to strategically teach people to be wasteful because it was not part of our material culture. Um, and there's a quote from Lloyd Stouffer. He's the editor of Modern Packaging Magazine, and he's at a plastics conference in 1956, right? So right after that Time, Time Magazine article, and he says, it's time for the plastics industry to stop thinking about reuse and concentrate on single use. 
This is a market that lies in the billions of units. And he followed this with this proud statement, the future of plastics is in the trash can. And in fact, he was not wrong. Okay, lobbyists really got behind this. There was ads everywhere. You're gonna free yourself from all, housewives could be freed from inconveniences. Um, in this disposable age, why should your baby bottle not be disposable? Um, it was just a huge praise of just single use. It was actually a strategic plan to teach people to live in a disposable culture. Um, and so, it's not, so the big thing was it's not convenient, it's not sanitary to reuse plastic. You know, we're in the modern age and it's a disposable age and this is what we should do. And I mean, that makes sense because if you're in the plastics industry and your business is making and selling new plastic, you need people to keep buying new plastic so you want them to throw it out. Um, and this is the beginning of like the tension between lobbyists and environmental activists and this this the rest of the story of plastic is really just this kind of ping pong between no this is really wrong we see the waste and the plastics industry coming up with another campaign to address it um, and for me i think this is really really fascinating because the consequences of the disposable material culture became obvious pretty quickly. And so this unblemished optimism about plastics as a wonder material really didn't last. By the 1960s, um, even so we're at the 1960s and Lloyd Stouffer's at another conference and this is seven years later and he is celebrating the rise and disposability of single use plastic. He says, it is a measure of your progress to his his compadres in the industry. It's a measure of your project progress and packaging that this remark that the future of plastic is in the trash will no longer raise any eyebrows. He congratulates them for filling the trash cans, the rubbish dumps, the incinerator with literally billions of plastic bottles, jugs, tubes, etc., and now even plastic cans. All right, but the consequences of the disposable material culture became pretty obvious pretty quickly. And in the 1960s, it was a decade where Americans were becoming really increasingly aware of environmental problems. Uh, 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, a very famous book about chemical pollution and toxicity came out. In the 1960s, it, I believe around 1965, uh, ocean, ocean plastic, um, debris, plastic debris was first observed in the ocean. There were oil spills, 1969, Santa Barbara, all along the coastline. You'd see surfers coming out of the water with their surfboards covered in oil, animals dying covered in oil. Um, the rivers along uh, rivers in Ohio were ca uh, catching on fire because the concentration of pollutants were so high. Um, so in the face of this, the plastic industry still has to stay in business. Um, so what do they do? Well, they created another campaign. <sighs> so I think many of you, if you're old enough, will remember this campaign. Um, this was a campaign that was Keep America Beautiful. It seemed like this very patriotic campaign. However, it was created by the beverage industries. And the goal of the campaign was to actually place the responsibility for all the waste and single use they created, not on the company, but on the individual. So it starts off with this video, uh, video of Native American, who's actually not at all a Native American. It's an uh, American Italian actor. <laughs> um, going down a river that quickly becomes polluted and a tear rolls down his face and it says, people start pollution, people can stop it. And this seemed like this really patriotic, I think many of us that are from this era remember this being like, this is terrible, pollution's terrible, we have to do something about it. But what the beverage company was doing was putting the responsibility on the consumer and in many cases, municipalities to pay and deal with the disposal of the waste that they created. Um, all right, so now this begs the question, right? Like, well, what about recycling? I mean, what about recycling? So here we go. Well, like, I think the first thing we have to do is define recycling, right? Um, and recycling is taking something 
breaking it back down and turning it back into the same thing. And this is great. Recycling is great. It is a critical part of a circular economy. And um, like a great example of this is an aluminum can. Aluminum is really energy intensive, really kind of environmentally destructive to mine, very useful. However, it is infinitely recyclable. You can take an aluminum can, melt it down over and make it into a new can. It is infinitely recyclable. So this is that example of the circular economy where once you make the material, it can infinitely be truly recycled, come back without reduction in quality as the same material. And what's great about that and a circular economy in general is that a recycled aluminum can truly recycled because it comes back as the same thing. Recycling that can takes 4% of the energy and therefore roughly 4% or less of the carbon footprint than creating a new metal can. All right, there's other things like glass is also very good at recycling, um, but let's go to plastic because that's kind of the elephant in a living room. I, let's just cut to the bottom. Recycling plastic is nearly impossible. It's never been possible. It's, there are some possible versions of recycling, but none of them are truly recycling. And that is because plastic cannot come back as the same type of plastic. Plastic, recycling plastic is expensive. It's chemically problematic. It's time consuming. Sorting all the different plastics that I showed you that come out of that refinery is really infeasible. But the real thing is that another big problem is that Every time you try to reuse plastic and you break down that chemistry, it degrades. So fundamentally, if you're defining recycling as breaking something down to turn it back into the thing that it was, in that context, in that definition, plastic cannot be recycled. A plastic bottle can never become a plastic bottle. It cannot be recycled. It can only be downcycled to something like fleece, like a polar fleece. And that's better than going to landfill, but essentially it's a recycling economy where that plastic bottle gets one more life before going to landfill because that plastic fleece, every time you do that, it's harder and harder to recover the materials. And essentially, unless you're gonna use straight upcycling strategies to take a fleece and patch it together and make it another fleece, it's not going to become a new material. Now, all the things that I've told you, the oil and plastic industries have always known it was in a series of documents, court reports that were um, hidden away and NPR did an amazing investigation on pulling out these reports. The oil and plastic industries have always known that plastic cannot be recycled. So like, let's just sit on that because despite full well knowing that the recycled plastics cannot be recycled, in fact, in 1974, there was a speech um, by an industry insider from the plastic industry saying there is serious doubt that recycling large quantities of plastic can ever be viable on an economic basis. It was never intended. Okay, so this was very plainly stated, but despite knowing this, it was in fact the oil and plastics industry that offered recycling as a solution. In the face of plastics reputation falling further and further as an anxiety about waste increased, the plastics industry said, no, no, we're going to recycle. Um, so that, that's maybe worth a real pause. Um, and this concern about waste was now beyond America. It was beyond the river, you know, in Ohio. This was around the world. And in fact, in the late 80s, a term came waste colonialism. And this is where we really see how um, the actions against our climate disproportionately affect different communities. And generally, the effects of climate and pollution adversely affect communities least responsible for generating the waste. Um, and this comes to the term waste colonialism. And that describes how waste and pollution are part of the domination of one group in their homeland by another group outside their homeland. It was coined in February 1989 at the United Nations Environmental Group a meeting. Um, 
uh, where African nations were concerning, um, expressing concerns about the disposal of hazardous waste by high GDP countries, basically the global north, into low GDP countries, the global south. And more recently, all of this leads all of this kind of the plastic never goes away. This is a way, right? This illegal recycling factory in Malaysia is what we call a way. There is no a way. And this is what's leading to a permanently and what I would call an unevenly polluted world. So we're in the face of all this. And um, the plastic, but now the plastic industry is like, well, we're in the business of selling plastic. This is really bad for us. How do we kind of keep selling plastic when all the waste being generated comes up? And ding, 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 recycling. <sighs> okay, so how did this all happen? Um, the plastics industry had to do something to keep people from buying new plastic. And so what they did in the 80s and 90s is launch literally a 50 million plus dollar a year US dollars every year recycling campaign. It involved neighborhood programs, it involved expensive sorting bins, it involved education, it involved going to public schools, it involved you know tons and tons of like plastics make it possible, your kid's not gonna get hurt when he's skateboarding, they won't get a head injury. Plastics are not only amazing, but they're recyclable and they're the future. Um, so, the recycling logo now became, as you can see, kind of on the, all these programs, they stamped that recycling logo, the one that is really kind of the heart of all this, um, onto everything, all right? Um, this recycling logo got stamped on everything. Bins of separated, expensive bins that were never actually going anywhere were launched in these expensive campaigns all around the United States. So like, how did this happen, all right? How did this recycling logo start and how did it get hijacked by the plastic industry to continue their campaign? Well, interestingly enough, the original logo came out of a design competition at the first Earth Day celebration in 1970. Now, this is the end of the 60s where you've seen the oil spills, you've seen the first plastic debris, You've seen, you know, rivers catching on fire, and there's this, you know, Rachel Carson's book. And so by 1970, this growing concern led to the first ever Earth Day celebration. And at this celebration, there was a logo competition. And this logo competition um, was won by Gary Anderson, a 23-year-old young man who came up with what was the original that triangle of arrows. Um, and he was inspired by the, by the fact that, you know, he wanted to communicate that the earth's resources are not infinite. We are extracting materials from the earth and if we don't put them back into the ecosystem, we're going to have this waste problem. Well, Gary Anderson created this logo to illustrate the lack of infinite resources and he was awarded $2,500 to continue his studies by the host. The host of this design competition that appeared at the first Earth Day celebration was no other than the Container Corporation of America. They awarded him these funds and then they implemented their symbol on their recycling products and began lobbying all the other plastics companies to do the same. They were so successful that this logo soon became public domain which means it can be no longer trademarked. Once you get something that out there that quickly, it can't, be, it can't be trademarked. Now it's public domain, so now it can be put on anything. In the 1980s, this was that the hijacking of the symbol was not too problematic because the only things that could be recycled were things that actually can be recycled, meaning they can come be broken down and re made new materials that are the same as the original material. So metal, that happens infinitely. Glass, can, um, you know, aside from some heat treated glasses and special cases like windshields, glass is the same. Paper can easily be recycled, but only about four or five times. It's not as bad as plastic, but it breaks down. The process of recycling paper, after four or five times, the fibers get weaker and it's compromised and you have to start adding virgin plastic to give it its material integrity. All right, so these are the 80s. Now let's fast forward um, to the 90s. Fast forwarding to the 90s, um, two types of plastics were 
uh, recyclers were saying, okay, we will take two types of plastic. And those were different beverage containers, okay? So now you legitimately have four bins. They all have Gary Anderson's logo on them. That's been kind of hijacked. And that kind of seems to be okay, except the oil and plastics industry was slapping that, leg that label on everything. All sorts of plastic, any kind of plastic, any kind of mis mixed plastic that had could never be recycled now had this logo. Well, that hijacking of the symbol for the plastic industry was not surprisingly really problematic for recycling because recycling facilities around the world were like, why is all of this stuff? Who told people they could put this in there? And it comes back to the fact that this stamp was put on everything. Now, here's something that it's really surprising how few people are aware of this. This triangular recycling symbol does not mean, nor has it ever mean, meant that this material can be recycled, never has. All it is is a branding strategy by it, by the market. And the only significance these symbols have is the number. And the number tells you simply what kind of plastic or mixed plastics are in it. It has nothing to do with whether it's recycled or not. So number two is high density polyethylene. Number three is polyvinyl chloride. Number four, low density polyethylene. You get the idea. Then there's the ubiquitous other which is a whole bunch of mixed plastics that even if you could recycle the individual components, once you mix materials, forget about it. And this was a really, really big problem. The, the, the industry spent millions, millions of dollars every year telling people to recycle because as one former industry um, insider told NPR, selling, re selling recycling, um, sold plastic, even if it wasn't true. And this was Larry Thomas. He was the former president of the Society of the Plastics Industry. What he said, and they said, why would you do that? And he said, if the public thinks that recycling is working, then they are not going to be concerned about the environment. And if they're not concerned about the environment, we stay in business. All right, so what actually gets recycled? The answer is not much in terms of plastics. Metals, glass, paper, fine. In terms of plastic, what actually gets recycled? And the thing is not much. Around 9% at max of all plastics get recycled. Most of the other things end up in a landfill, get incinerated, or maybe their best chance is going to a MRF. And that's the kind of um, plastic grocery store bags, for instance, can go to a MRF and maybe be resold. Um, so they get sorted, hopefully sold. So that would be kind of a that would actually be a version of recycling where they're taking this and they're reselling the films that can be used. Um, except because of that big problem with the recycling symbol, anything plastic that can't be recycled gets dumped in here. So the sorting becomes impossible. It's almost in terms of time and cost, totally infeasible to do this. And the biggest culprit behind this is those films, those plastic films that cassettes are wrapped in, your Amazon orders, the ones you never asked for, but somehow industry makes you responsible for safely disposing of are the worst because those film plastics really cannot be recycled, but they get mixed in and they gunk up all the machines. So that makes the machines have to stop, the, the, the thin plastic films have to be removed, hopefully they start up again. The other issue with them is those plastic films have an extremely low resale value. What a MRF does is uh, that's a material, um, a material uh, resource facility. What happens is that the plastics wind up, um, they have a very low resale value. So the MRF winds up, like it's not worth selling it. No one, you would have to spend like pennies on the ton for these materials. So what the facility winds up doing is paying to now send these to a landfill. So instead of going directly to the landfill, now going by mucking up your recycling bin with this aspirational or wish cycling and just throwing everything in there without knowing whether it can be recycled, it has kind of two problems. It gunks up the facility and they wind up having to pay to send it away, which essentially adds a tax on recycling. So now recycling of plastic, which is 
industry knew forever was like kind of economically infeasible is even more expensive. And the, it's the, actually the recyclers that get hit with that tax. Okay, so this is clearly a problem. Um, and so when we talk about what actually gets recycled, the other thing we have to think about is plastic is in almost everything. And not only unrecyclable materials are a problem, but mixed materials are a huge problem. And this really is like the fashion textile industry is a space where this is, is extremely problematic. For instance, plastic is in a lot of our clothes. Polyester, 1% spandex will render something completely unrecyclable because the, the sorting machines, it's a lot like the films at the MRF. If you have something with 1% spandex, it gunks up the machine, you have to start all over. It renders a material, adding just a little bit of spandex will to make a material that could either otherwise be composted or recycled or upcycled, re unrecyclable. Coatings are another really big problem. Um, and so it's men, much like those films at the MRF that, that are the cover all our kind of Amazon products, 1% um, spandex renders a piece of clothing unrecyclable. And this is, this is a really huge problem because this is like by design meant to go to a landfill and by design, you need to buy more plastics to make more materials in this way. All right, so what about recycled polyester, right? There's a lot of talk about, you know, recycled polyester and making yoga pants from plastic bottles, et cetera. All right, so two disclaimers on recycled polyester. First of all, recycled polyester, known as RPET, is not polyester at all. Um, it, it, it's PET. Um, it is uh, polyethylene terephthalate. I probably said that with a couple syllables missing, but it's a, it's a different material. It's still the material in the plastic bottle, except it's downgraded. So recycled polyester is neither recycled, it's downcycled, and it's not polyester, it's PET. Now, it's a lot better than this plastic bottle going to a landfill, but it's really important to keep in mind that this takes what would be a linear cradle to grave model, and it gives it one more loop. One more loop is better than, you know, sing, single use right to the grave, grave, but it's one more use. And because it's a textile and it's now being respun into fibers, we're introducing microfiber plastic pollution all throughout um, the life cycle of this from washing to wearing to creating. So, and then eventually those yoga pants cannot be recycled or downcycled again, they end up in landfill. All right. So that was a lot <laughs> probably to unpack. Um, I really am surprised we covered that much in 40 minutes. I hope it was digestible. But now I want to talk about, you know, once you know how you got into a situation, how do we get out of a situation? And I think now I want to open this up to a discussion of, is there a way out? Um, but in starting that discussion, I'd really like to tip my hat and thank, um, give you some action items the list here is a combination of, of different resources I've pulled, but most of them actually come from the wonderful podcast by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Alex Bloomberg um, about action items, about you know, what, you can, what kind of action you can take. Um, it's a list here. They all have links. It's some more resources. A lot of the history of plastic and the lobbyist was uncovered by um, investigative journalism by NPR. So they have a couple of Planet Money series uh, episodes, which I encourage you to watch. Um, but I think that the one thought I could kick this off with was if campaigns and activism, and you know, we've always seen this environmental backlash against the industry and a campaign and an incentive and a campaign. And and I think that's a very interesting place to come forward and have what is the incentive? Can we have an incentive that's truly sustainable? And I say sustainable, meaning it takes in all the facets, um, ethically, environmentally, economically sustainable to do things a different way. Um, and at this point, I would really love to open this up to just a discussion. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about and I'm quite sure I've talked enough. Um, so I wanted to open up the discussion to all of you about, you know, what's surprising? Do you have any questions? Is there something you want more information on? And 
Um, I'd love to see your faces and hear your voices. Let's see where we want to begin. Um, Sinalo asked, how can we ensure the sustainable conversation today is actually sustainable for the next millions of years? I think that's a big question to begin with, but. <laughs> so, uh, so that's Gail, a million years is a collection of generations. So maybe how I would approach this is scaling it to this generation and maybe the next. Um, for me, I think some the way I approach this through education, through activism, through you know signing camp, being in, you know signing legislation, being involved in campaigning, education is I bring to this that the materials and resources I'm using today are not inherited from the generation before me, but they're borrowed from the generation after me. And so I think starting there is something that I can get my head around because this problem is personally that this is a big problem, right? So I think the first approach to this is to look at material supply chains, look at what we consume and see where we can have action. So there's a couple of different, I mean, there's starting small and scaling. So that was a big question. And so I'm going to uh, see if there's another one that follows it. But I think the thing that we can do now is, is really pay attention and as much as possible, kind of pull the curtain back um, on some of these things. And, and you know, OpenEDU is amazing for this because we have um, an opportunity where it's like, you know, a slow factory says, you know, you'll never, the institution's never gonna give you the education you need to overthrow it. Um, so I think with this in mind, you know, it's a lot of it is paying attention and realizing that we do have some power. I mean, clearly the plastic industry is very concerned with what we think of them. And having um, if a forced transparency on where things go might actually make effective strategies on what to do with the existing plastic we have. So I've done a lot of international sustainable development work. And one thing that we think about is as plastic, you know, plastic can be a building material. I've built homes off grid by filling, you know, those large plastic jugs with sand and kind of, it's, it's durable. One thing I think we have to do is think about plastic as a durable material and focus manufacturers to say, I, you know, I, manufacturers need to have a tax on wrapping everything in plastic. I ordered this. I did not order the plastic. I did not order the bubble wrap. And as much as I feel very, very guilty for having to do something with it, that responsibility should not be on the customer. We have to find a way to, and, and taxes are a great way to do it. We see that taxing companies for including unnecessary single use plastic is very effective. They're not gonna lose money or they don't wanna lose money or customers. By the same token that uh, Recycling Is It BS podcast talks about that actually the effectiveness of a, a, ta of a tax on a plastic bag is more effective than a ban. And I've worked with some of the New York City surf rider tractors that are very involved in this New York state legislation, legislation on banning the bag. And interestingly, that's not as effective as taxing a bag. And here's why. When you ban a plastic bag, to get that into law, you have to be very specific about what kind of plastic and what thickness. So it's very easy to just come up with another bag that's outside those material parameters that isn't banned. So banning, taxing things becomes different. And it is very, very strange what, when people are used to getting something for free, all of a sudden a five or 10 cents tax is enough for them to say, no, thank you, I don't need it. There's an interesting question from Mariana, Christopher, and a few others who mention the global South countries that have to basically inherit all of this waste that they did not ask for, and now is a huge problem for them. Um, what? How can people support um, the global South countries that are trying to refuse um, this waste and uh, you know, put sanctions on these um, global North countries, mainly the US, so that they don't have to deal with this waste? Like what can people do in order to help global South countries with um, this issue, fighting this issue? So I always think of things starting with your own action and then how that can be scaled to larger action. So for one thing, a big issue is like, people are like, oh, but I donated my clothes. Well, where did, 
it, it's it's kind of the follow through. So did you donate your clothes to a place that you know where they're going to end up? Or did you just drop them off and hope for the best, right? This is like, it's so confusing. In fairness, it's so confusing. And so much of the onus is put on the consumer and the individual to fix this problem. It's very hard. But one thing we can do is kind of find out where our things are going. So, you know, I spent a lot of time in um, Artibonit in the north of Haiti doing um, international development work and solar electrification. And you see just like these piles of garbage. It's, it's, it's textile wastelands that are sent from the global north. And that actually ruins their artists and economy, right? Because you've got all these junky clothes for free that are essentially garbage, but they have to do something with them. And it's either selling them if they can or lighting them on fire. But at the same time, it really kills a really beautiful part of the culture and identity as a source of entrepreneurship, which is traditional arts. So I think one thing on an individual level is, is understanding where the things are going and trying to be conscientious about knowing different avenues for where they can go and being a little bit conscientious about this is not high quality, but it can go to wearable collections, which is for profit and at the worst case can turn this into fluff. Bolts of fabric can be sent to fab scrap, which if they can sell it, it's great. A lot of the mixed fabrics, they make this insulation material too. I think being thoughtful about where you send it, but I think applying pressure at the government level um, and taxes for exports. Um, and you know that's a little bit trickier for the individual, but as you start to get engaged a little bit in the activism and reaching out to council people, and, and, the, and being really involved in the government. I mean, writing a letter and getting a thousand people in your community, which sounds like a lot, but it moves quickly, right? I mean, how many people are logged into this call right now? Getting that's enough that a senator or a congressperson has to address it. They have to spend some time on it. And that kind of pressure, you know, they need to be reelected. They cannot just have ignored their people. So I think um, the biggest, we do have a lot of responsibility, but. I like to focus on the responsibility on the individual level, not as like, oh my God, what should I do with this plastic wrap? I feel so guilty, but also to say like, okay, how can I engage effectively in systemic change in a grassroots kind of way? And I think that one of the wonderful things about this open EDU is that there's many, many different voices and we can kind of collaborate and build community um, that can be really revolutionary with focused you know, with focused goals and focused pressure and understanding. Um, if I hopefully that answers your question, but I think it's always starting small and then and working up. And to some degree, I think we all feel really <sighs> disillusioned and disenfranchised from any kind of effective government. It seems to be getting better, but I don't think that serves us. I think we have to get together and um, put that kind of political pressure and and believe a little bit in the original tenets of of government and just kind of push really hard there. Thank you for that, Theanne. Um, we have a few questions from Victoria, Wilma, and a few other people asking about alternative plastics. So for example, bioplastics or degradable plastics, are these alternative, sus alternative sustainable solutions to petroleum-based plastic, or are they just another myth and another marketing campaign? They're not great. <laughs> uh, let's say they're not great. So, and I, but I think that has to do similarly with like the miseducation around a recycling symbol, um, what they are. So when people, and, and I think this is like the scientists where it's like, let's define what we're talking about, right? So um, PLA, like you're gonna, you know, feel good about having this picnic with your single use plastic. So it's not gonna be, you know, a polyethylene plastic, it's gonna be a corn-based plastic. I can tell you that those bioplastics, when they are biodegradable in industrial situations, high heat, high pressure, they're not breaking down in your backyard. I compost, I have a regenerative agriculture, a little mini garden, and if I put a PLA fork in my compost bin, turn it over, add the nutrients, five years later, that, that corn-based PLA fork is perfectly intact. It has not returned to the earth as nutrients for the next generation of materials. So if you are working on a large scale where you have events and you take the responsibility to send have a separate collection facility, send PLA and bioplastics to a place where they can be reintegrated 
into the material economy, wonderful. But what the reality happens is it just goes right to landfill. And my students and I have done a calculation on the impact, environmental impact of manufacturing PLA versus other plastics, it's not better. So unless you can ensure biodegradability, which requires a full system around it, it's not better. That said, if you're using corn waste, you know, husks and corn waste, that's also fine if you're instead of extract, extracting virgin fuels. But I think one thing to keep in mind is also like this insane confusion created by industry on what goes where and how can you recycle? Because what people wind up doing is throwing, um, you know, and you guys are on set or have like, kind of are in production and you have these meals and they're like, okay, great, it's compostable. But what happens is people don't throw those in the trash, which is the best option, even though they like that you won't biodegrade, they throw them in the recycling bin because they're still a kind of plastic. And now what you've done is rendered that entire recycling bin contaminated and unrecyclable. Um, so it's, it's like, I hesitate to like mix the pot and say, it's so hard to learn what everything is. It's not so hard, but it, you do have to be thoughtful. And I think the biggest thing is to not take things at face value, but the, the bioplastics can be better in a way that rarely is actually accessed where they go to um, a high heat, high pressure facility and then do get bro broken down for nutrients. Pian, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the best way that we can individually act on like to scale our actions would be to reach out to you know our senator maybe pass around a, a petition or a letter that multiple people sign mm -hmm. um aja barber has a question on how do we put pressure on corporations like does that look the same as governmental pressure or or, or does that look different? Um, here she mentions Coca-Cola as a massive greenwasher of this conversation. And of course we know Nestle and Pepsi, all these large beverage corporations. How do we pressure them to change their ways as corporations? Buy Coke only in cans and bottles. Buy them only in aluminum cans and only in glass bottles. Just don't buy them. If there's no market for their plastic bottles, they're gonna put more effort into um, having those be recycling programs. If you have a brand you love, one thing I've noticed is that smaller brands, you know, they're, they're really doing their best to be as ethical and sustainable as possible, but then they, they kind of miss the mark. It's hard. We're all learning and the perfect is the enemy of the good when you're trying to do something. Brands, um, you can reach out to them and you can reach out to them with a collection of people say, we love your brand. Um, we'd love to support it, but we find this really problematic. And, you know, maybe constructively say, is there a way that, you know, you could cut this out? I think it's always about not complaining about a problem, but just acknowledging something and saying, hey, is there a way we can do better? Here's some suggestions. I think that, I think there's a lot of greenwashing, but I think there's a lot of brands that truly are trying to do better. And we know it's complicated. And I think for the most part, they welcome that kind of educated feedback, especially if it's like, would you consider taking this back and re reusing it? Age of COVID has made kind of take back policies a little bit tricky, um, but there's things like TerraCycle, which you can kind of send anything to and they'll melt it down into new things or find a home for it. Um, there's, you can order your mix of things, especially people are not going to the stores a lot. Loop is a store that you can send your favorite things back to and they refill it and send it to you. Um, and I think, you know, clearly by its multi-million dollar campaigns, the plastics and packaging industries are aware of this. They're sensitive, they're paying attention. Um, it's just that, you know, they kind of like see the environmentalist fire come up and they try to like make people feel better with something. And I think it's just, it's just to stay on it um, and to really realize that your voice matters. Yeah, thank you for that, Theanne. Um, Idol, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, sorry if I'm butchering it, um, has a question about um, the finite nature of oil. So we know that, you know, this is a finite, oil is a finite resources. And so they're asking if you think that, do you think fossil fuels will come to an end and as a result, manufacturing of plastic come to an end too? And I'm, I really, 
wanted to ask this question because what is also what does it look like for the earth and people when fossil fuels come to an end like that feels how close are we to that and what what does the the rest of the environment look like when we we get to that point not just for plastic but for you know all of the, the world you, you know I think that like this is going to maybe shock people, but I think in a certain place and for certain things, fossil fuels and plastics are, make sense. It depends on the local needs. It depends on the availability. It depends if you can integrate that into some stewardship. In the beginning, Bakelite was like, these things were meant to be, you know, piano keys. They were meant to be things that lasted your whole generation and another generation. Plastics, the original excitement and intention of plastics was to create really durable materials for a range of applications. And so for, and, and I mean, plastics do have a place where some things make sense. For instance, a car, cars are now like 30% plastic and the fuel efficiency, you know, it's so much lighter that you get much higher fuel efficiency and that's directly correlated to a carbon footprint. Um, for biomedical applications, I mean, for but for medical things, plastics make sense, right? There's certain areas where it makes sense. Um, and the area that it, it doesn't make sense is the area where nothing makes sense, which is single use. If you line up the manufacturing environmental impacts of a plastic bag, a canvas bag, and a brown paper bag, you may be surprised to know that if you're going to use all of them once, by far the plastic bag, not including end of life kind of plastic pollution, but that plastic bag has by far the lowest impacts. If you start using things often, right? The, the, the paper is heavy, it's a lot more trucks, it requires tons of chemicals and chlorine to, to take a tree and make it into paper. Cotton is also very demanding. It, if you, but then if you, you, you can do the calculation of the footprint. If you use a cotton tote bag 167 times, you more than balance out the difference in manufacturing environmental impacts to a plastic bag and you don't have these end of life effects. So I think something that we're, that people miss is that they want the one hit wonder of the material they can use any way they want. And I don't care what material you're using it, you have to like extend the life of things. You Things have to be created with more care and more respect and without this idea of disposability. Unless it's a medical situation, an emergency situation, there's absolutely no reason for disposability of materials to be any part of anyone's life. So I love that you mentioned end of life because we just got a question from um, Valentine and she's asking, is it possible to consider growth and decay as part of the design process? And this is, you asked the right person the right question because if anybody knows about growth and decay and end of life and life cycles, it is Dr. Theanne Shiros. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely in my wheelhouse. Um, our, a big part of um, my research program is actually um, using microbes to build up high value materials that can be broken down as nutrients to, an, to replenish the soil to grow the next class of high value materials um, at their end of their life. So, I mean, I am absolutely fascinated by, from the beginning, design and engineering of materials for climate should look to nature's efficiency and processes. So that means using low energy consuming organisms, yeast, bacteria, microbes, to produce products with minimum inputs, and that can, and then green chemistry to, you know, have them assemble to do all the things that you'd like them to do without introducing any kind of chemical intervention that compromises the toxicity or biodegradability. And at the end of the useful life, they can be actually backyard composted. So when we talk about bio, I don't care about biodegradability. I mean, things are bio, that doesn't, that mean, that word is like now sustainability or, it, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that much. What about backyard compostability where you're comfortable taking this material, chopping it up and putting it in your compost bin and adding it to, you know, nourish your soil. And so with Slow Factory, um, we actually, I teamed up with, through the one by one, I was teamed up with Public School New York, and we set out to create 
a pair of biodegradable sneakers, which was not a trivial undertaking. And we used microbes to spin a certain kind of bio leather. Um, we used minerals and plants to process and tan it so that it would have color and material properties. Um, we grew it to shape. So the, every piece of that sneaker was actually grown to shape by the microbes because they grow until you stop them from growing and you can find the, you know, you make your container the shape of the side of your shoe and it grows you a piece of material that cuts out 30% of the impacts right there in, in clipping bits. And then I, we did a backyard biodegradability study and after dyeing and tanning, um, in 60 days out in the soil in my backyard under normal conditions, we recorded the temperature, the pH, they lost almost 70% of their mass. And they're going back to the earth as nutrients to grow my flowers, to, to dye the next round of textiles with. So, I mean, I think this is a beautiful area. I think it's, um, it's not only really, like you can merge the frontiers of biotechnology with something I'm so interested in is, is merging indigenous science with the frontiers of biotechnology in a very respectful way where there's dignity on, on both knowledge bases. I mean, indigenous science has given us, it's it's not low tech, it's, it's, it's super high tech. And if we can kind of, indigenous science has been formed over millennia before we got into the last 50 years of plastic and you know, petrochemical based dyes and coating. And now we have all this like really elegant biotechnology and a big, like, a, you know, the driving force in some of the material science research I do is to merge those things and to sort of look to the wisdom. I mean, second to nature's genius perfected over 3.8 billion years is the indigenous science that worked with that genius to develop kind of protocols for processes for our materials. Um, really beautiful high value materials have been made for millennia using without petrochemicals, without plastics. And so now if we can have a future where we kind of grow the future with microbes in collaboration and then bring in some of those techniques, I personally see that, I mean, that's what my most of my research is rooted in. And I see that as a direction where it um, humans take a very humble role and we just sort of like, what can we learn from our ancestors in nature? And, you know, what tools can we build to put them together? And I think honestly, like knocking ourselves off a pedestal and having some humility in how we deal with the natural resources of the earth that sustains us right there, that cultural shift, that paradigm shift in how we approach materials will be game changing. Well, I hope I haven't left you with a bleak perspective. My intention was, you know, you have to understand the problem to come up with the solution. So and I, I was hoping just to kind of clarify some of the confusion around it and then open up ideas of how you can specifically take action. Um, so I think talking about it sometimes is, is a little bit depressing um, because it's like, what? This is just This is just a whole like fraud <laughs> conspiracy. But at the same time, once you know how we were in how, individuals and communities were pulled into that, we can be like, oh no, no, that's not gonna work anymore. Here's, here's what you're gonna do. And so I hope this was a knowledge is power. Um, that was the intention of it, not to make you sad, <laughs> um, but to see that like, I think with a growing community, we can find our way out of this mess. Um, and and it, it's gonna operate on kind of systemic levels, individual levels. Um, and I just want to extend immense gratitude for the power of community. Um, in collaboration. And I'm very hopeful that through transdisciplinary collaboration and this kind of open inclusive forum that we can find a different kind of symbiosis with each other and materials and, and kind of use that as a power that can be leveraged to flip the script <laughs> on how we um, interact with materials and each other.